uh, peripheral artery interventions and leads a very large interventional program uh, from Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he has had multiple publications and research studies in the area of percutaneous and minimally invasive surgery, surgical techniques for peripheral intervention and revascularization. And the charge today that we have given him is to talk and share his expertise on retrograde access. Unfortunately, because of some internet uh, difficulties, we will not be able to share the video of his cases. However, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, and I think conversation with him and his expert comments on, on how he chooses his devices, techniques, and strategies would be extremely delightful. I'll ask Mehdi to share his entire presentation, including a summary of his videos and clips with us so we can post it on xlpad.org and, and, uh, and give you an opportunity to review those cases and maybe even invite him for a second turn uh, to make up uh, for, uh, the, uh, for the cases today. So Mehdi, take it away, and uh, again, welcome, and thank you for joining in uh, from an off-site location out of the United States today. Thank you very much, Dr. Banerjee. I'm uh, honored uh, to be invited. Uh, I know many of you, if not all of you, are experts uh, and uh, do all the things that I do. So it's really uh, humbling and an honor to, uh, you know, to be invited to do this. Um, I am uh, really sorry that the slides are not able to present. I am sending you a PDF file of them, which you can share with everybody, and I will be happy to send videos too. And I'm hoping that in the midst of the presentation, the slides show up there, and maybe we can uh, go back to them. In any case, uh, again, I'm really sorry, and uh, I'm happy to do it again if you want me to. Uh, so in any case, basically the topic that he gave me was uh, related to ritual grade access. And uh, in my opinion, uh, before even uh, considering retrograde access, we always have to ask, you know, why do we even consider retrograde access? So in order to answer this question, I went uh, to the only trial that has uh, evaluated uh, endovascular versus surgery um, in patients with critical limb ischemia in the basal trial. As you may recall, in the basal trial, and again, I'm sorry, you don't have the slides, in the basal trial, there were 585 patients that were included in the study. Those 585, 61% of them had come from six recruiting centers. However, of the 585, 386 patients were excluded right off the bat because the interventionalist and the surgeon felt that there were no options for the patient. So we lost about 60% of the patients that were told this and there is no option available to you. How about those that were included in the study? So if you look at the basal trial, you see that about 25% of the patients could not be crossed in an anti-grade fashion. Now, mind you, these were very select group of patients that were candidate both for endo and surgery. Now, if you look at the basal trial, you may say, listen, this is a clinical trial. These folks may not have had a lot of experience. However, if you look at the publications from Leipzig, you see that even at Leipzig, you know, the folks that have a lot of experience with the, you know, uh, uh, CLI and, in general, endovascular intervention, they also fail to cross lesion in an anti fashion about 25% of the time, 20 to 25% of the time. And as you know, there's a number of publications that have shown the safety of the retrograde approach. You know, uh, Montero Baker published this, Kevin Rogers, Espinosa. There are a number of publications that have shown that the retrograde approach is successful and safe. The question is that, you know, uh, when do you, should you go to the retrograde approach? Do you go to the retrograde approach after trying the anti-grade after five minutes, after 10 minutes, after 30 minutes? You base it on the equipment and the number of wires you have used. Do you go to the retrograde approach after trying for, you know, five wires, four wires, eight wires? Do you go to the retrograde approach after using the CTO device? How many CTO devices? How long? Do you uh, state the procedure? If you tried anti-grade and it didn't work, do you go for two hours and if it didn't work, then it's okay, I do retrograde. So in our own institution, you know, we have a low threshold to go retrograde. We typically go by time. If we try for five, 10 minutes, and if it doesn't work in an anti-grade fashion, we then go to a retrograde approach. And we actually published our work, uh, and I'm checking the email here to see if this PDF is made to you, it still hasn't come to you. Um, in any case, we worked uh, at our own institution and we looked at our own experience with complex patients and uh, having a low threshold to go retrograde. And we saw that we could increase our success rate from about uh, 65% in the anti-grade 
to about 93% in a richer grade. Again, we have a low threshold of going richer grade, so we don't spend two hours trying to integrate and then bring the patient back. We actually prepare the leg at the time that uh, patients come, patients with CLI. We prepare the leg, so we clean the leg from knee down all the way to the toes, so they're prepared for the retrograde approach. So if we try integrate for five, 10 minutes, it doesn't work to go retrograde. Now, the retrograde approach, there are three areas where you can get retrograde uh, access, in my opinion. The first one is a retrograde SFA popliteal approach. And there are two uh, 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 possible approaches with this. There is an ultrasound-guided approach, which is most people are used to. You put the patient in a prone position, use ultrasound, you compress on the vein, you know which one is the vein, and you try to go to the artery. Typically, right at the knee joint, the vein is on top of the artery when you're coming in a prone position, so you want to go about two to three centimeters, you know, the, the cephalate towards the head. We actually, about four years ago, decided to do these procedures in a supine position because it was so cumbersome to do them in a prone position. The patient was uncomfortable, and we typically don't like to treat in a retrograde fashion. So we like to use the retrograde access to cross the lesion and then use the anti-grade to actually treat. So we cross the lesion, we externalize the wire, and we treat from the top. <clears throat> so for a supine position, it's very difficult to do it with ultrasound. What we typically do, we rotate the leg 30 degrees externally and, and uh, flex the knee in a frog position. We then place the fluoroscopy, and again, I'm really sorry you guys don't have the images and the slides, you know, uh, I apologize, really. Uh, we then put the eye on the contralateral side, so 30 degree contralateral to the leg that we're trying to access. And then using a, a micropuncture needle uh, and injecting dye from the top, just like we do with the pedal and tibial access, we go four centimeter above the knee joint and we try to get access in the proximal popliteal artery. The issue with the popliteal uh, access is that you obviously need to have some room uh, to uh, be able to, uh, uh, to advance the wire and then be able to advance your support catheter and your sheet. And uh, so therefore, um, it is, uh, uh, you need to have a distance. You need to have about you know, seven to 10 centimeter distance that you can advance your wire and have enough support to then be able to advance your support character, an 018 support character, or a four frame sheet. Um, we typically do not put a sheet, we just use a support character, and with just the support character, you are able to cross the lesion and externalize the wire and then treat the SFA. However, as I said, um, uh, you know, uh, in many cases, you know, the, you have occlusion of the SFA and the pop, and you cannot get pop facial access. In those situations, we may have to come to the retrograde tibial access. Now, I typically divide the retrograde tibial access and pedal access. To me, they are different. I think that if you're just starting to get retrograde access, you should start with a pedal. The risk of uh, compartment syndrome is zero. Um, hemostasis is much easier. Uh, and access is much easier because the arteries are so superficial. Tibial access, I typically use it when I have total occlusion of the SFT pop and pop. I have tried in the anti-grade fashion, I'm not successful, and I feel that if I get pedal access, I will not have enough support to be able to recanalize the SFA popliteal artery. So that's the time that I go for a tibial access. Now, the same principles for popliteal access and for even anti-grade or retrograde uh, uh, common femoral access apply. You need to have a landing zone that you can advance the wire and be able to advance a support character or a sheet over that wire. If you go too close to the lesion, you won't be able to advance your sheet or support character because uh, obviously the floppy part of the wire is in the artery and you won't have the support to be able to advance the sheet and the support character. And I apologize if I'm repeating that again and again because you don't have the pictures. I'm not sure if I'm being clear with my uh, instructions. And aside from that, uh, aside from that, uh, you know, uh, uh, what uh, for the pedal access? Uh, the first question is that you know what do we use for the uh, access? So we typically use a, a micropuncture kit. For pedal access, I usually use the four centimeter needle uh, because it's uh, shorter, and uh, these vessels are diseased. Uh, blood flow is not very robust, 
And a lot of times, I think interventionalists, they go through the vessel because they don't have the patience. Um, if you're using ultrasound, uh, obviously, if you have a technician, it's very helpful. If you don't have a technician, you can use one of the side rights or better machines. A hockey stick would be very helpful if you're using that. As you know, there are two veins for every artery, so you can try to locate the vessel in that way. Once you have located the vessel, either yourself or the technician or your fellow, you then need to use the needle to find the ultrasound beam. So the worst thing you can do is to tell the technician or your fellow or yourself to find the needle. Because once you move your ultrasound beam to find the needle, you now lost a vessel. So it's very important that the needle finds the ultrasound and the vessel and not the ultrasound try to find the needle. And if you can see the ultrasound, if you can see the needle on the ultrasound machine, then you're in the right approach. Then you have everything correct. The principle with the ultrasound and the fluoroscopy is exactly the same. You need to be perpendicular to the beam. So if you're using the ultrasound, your needle, you have to think of the needle as one of the ultrasound beam signals. And then you're trying to hit the artery just like the ultrasound probe is. So if the ultrasound probe is uh, what is oblique, your needle has to be oblique. If ultrasound needle uh, uh, probe is uh, perpendicular, your needle has to be perpendicular. You have to be in the same direction as the beam of the ultrasound. Or if you're doing fluoroscopy, in the same direction as the II, as the fluoroscopy, as the X-ray beam. We then use a micropuncture needle, uh, get access. Once we have blood flow, we typically try to use the O18 wire. Now, I typically do not use the wire that comes in the pedal kit because I try not to put a sheet in the pedal vessels. I typically only use the O18 support catheter. And with the O18 support catheter, I try to cross the lesion and externalize the wire. So I try to minimize trauma to the pedal and the tibial arteries and even popliteal arteries by not putting a sheet. If I need to put a sheet, I typically put a four French uh, radial sheet uh, two more has nice sheets um, uh, that you know that are available uh, that I use, and I don't have any financial relationship with Trumo or any company. Uh, once I've crossed the lesion, uh, I can then externalize the wire. Now, the radiation to the hand is always an issue. That's why for pedal access, you know, if you can get used to the ultrasound, it works well. As you know, Spectronetic has this quick access device that is available. Some people use it. It's a little bit of a pain in the neck uh, because you're controlling the wire. It does have a locking mechanism at the end to lock the wire, but uh, it is if once you use it a few times, you can get used to it and can be used to uh, and not radiate your hands. The other option, obviously, is to use the radiation-proof gloves so your hands don't get radiated, but we need to protect ourselves. So you can use either ultrasound or fluoroscopy, and again, I wish these pictures were there because you know I think some of them are nice. It's painful that this, uh, even the PDF that I'm trying to send you still is uh, trying to load. It's unbelievable. Uh, in any case, we then, uh, once uh, we have access, you know, the, what are the issues that we need to worry about? With the pedal access, as I mentioned, the risk of compartment syndrome is zero. For, uh, from the standpoint of hemostasis, all you need is two fingers. So if you have a fellow technician, your coworker, somebody can put your, their fingers on top of the pedal access. And what we do is that as soon as we have externalized the wire, we try to remove the equipment from the pedal access. So we don't keep things in there. We want to remove things. We want to get flow to the foot because, as you know, many of these patients have only one vessel in the foot. And if you're having four French, five French sheets in there for a long time, even if you're anticoagulating aggressively, you want, you can occlude these vessels. And, the, and we know that from the radial experience. We know that from the radial experience, even if you use a lot of anticoagulation, between 25 to 30 uh, uh, percent of the time, the radial artery occludes as the radial uh, interventions for coronary uh, procedures. So, uh, so I think you need to be careful. And radial artery typically is not disease. These are disease arteries that have run up. I am really concerned about the idea of doing uh, pedal, uh, you know, work, meaning doing full intervention from the pedal uh, access and also putting sheets there for a long period of time. I am very aggressive with anticoagulation. And I typically keep my ACT between 250 to 350. But you need to be careful if you, you know, so you don't perforate uh, with hydrophilic wires because you can get compartment syndrome if you don't pay attention, especially in females uh, with high uh, ACT. For tibial access, 
Uh, we typically use fluoroscopy because the tibial vessels are deep in the calf t- uh, muscles. Uh, we use the long micropuncture needle, the seven centimeters, to be able to reach. We invariably use the 018 long support. I use the Platinum Plus usually, or one of these uh, Boston wires, uh, and uh, to give me support to get my micro uh, support catheter over the 018 uh, wire in there. And I use the 018 support catheter typically. Again, I try not to put sheets to minimize the risk of compartment and the concerns about hemostasis. For tibial access, I typically use a, a cuff. So after we have crossed the lesion, we put a cuff uh, on the access site. We go up for five minutes, uh, about 10 millimeters of mercury above the systolic pressure. In the meantime, we are working on this SFA and POP and doing our work. So we are doing our work while the uh, cuff is there. After that, we check. The most important thing from tibial access standpoint is that you have you check your access site and make sure there is no extravasation at the end of the case. So you have to be 100% sure that you don't have any extravasation. And I don't typically reverse my anticoagulation. Again, as I said, I use the cuff. You need to have some other equipment uh, if you're trying to do retrograde access. Obviously, sometimes you can try to uh, reach, uh, wire the sheet or the uh, diagnostic catheter in a retrograde approach, uh, but sometimes this doesn't work. You need to have a snare. I typically use a five to 10 millimeter snare. There's a quick cross capture device that is Spectronetic has. I don't use that device, but some folks use it. You need a wire cutter because sometimes you damage the wire. You need a blood pressure cuff, standing blood pressure cuff, so you can obtain hemostasis. And it would be nice to have an extra hand to help you. Some of the other techniques that you need to have, obviously when you're doing retrograde access, sometimes you spend an hour and a half getting retrograde access, you cross the lesion, but you cannot get luminal. So you need to be familiar with the CART technique, reverse CART, parallel balloon technique. You need to know about the reentry devices, such as the, the Covidian interior device that sometimes we have used, and also how to uh, get into the true lumen using a CTO device wires, such as the Confienza approach or the Estado, where you use the CTO device and put a tight pen. And I know you guys are gurus of uh, CTO, so you don't have to, uh, I don't have to tell you anything about that. The issues related to the retrograde and CLI, obviously, you know, uh, we typically, when we do these presentations, you know, folks say, oh, why you spend two hours trying to do these procedures? You use 10 wires, you know, you do retrograde access. And I always say, you know, you save somebody's limb, you save their life. The impact that saving a limb has on patients is tremendous. And, uh, and so in these kind of uh, uh, the lesions and patients, you need to be... Uh, 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 consider it uh, and uh, be thoughtful and mindful that you have to use multiple devices. If you think that you're going to uh, cross a CTO uh, in a CLI patient with one or two wires, I think the likelihood of that would be less than 10-15% of the time. You need to be uh, comfortable with a series of wires, be able to use uh, wires interchangeably. You may need to get to the cap using the CTO wire, then change to a hydrophilic wire, then change back to a CTO wire. Same thing if you're coming in a retrograde approach, so you have to have a lot of patience, you have to be familiar with a lot of equipment, and you need to be willing to change from equipment to equipment. Now, unfortunately, none of these videos are working and uh, none of these uh, images, but, you know, as I said, people access is safe, but I've had patients that have been referred to me where folks have tried to uh, do uh, pedal access, and unfortunately, they have caused perforations because they were in a branch, they thought they were in the pedal access, pedal loop, uh, or in the pedal vessels, but uh, they actually were not. So yes, it is safe to get pedal access. Uh, it's much safer than doing tibial access. But um, as I said, uh, you know, it's, uh, it can uh, lead to complications, perforations. And remember, typically these are the only vessels that are available in the foot. So the last thing we want to do is lose these uh, targets for potential bypass or even endovascular intervention by not being careful. I had a bunch of cases that I put here, about three, four cases. But I think they're kind of, you know, without images, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense to go over them, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I apologize again profusely. You know, I'm really sorry uh, that this slide didn't make it there. I can stop here. We can, you know, maybe have some discussion if you like. I think, I think uh, despite the limitations of not having the images, I think this was very, very useful. 
uh, I'm sure uh, many of the attendees would share. Uh, you know, in, I would like, if possible, uh, there are many experienced people logged into the call, and I would ask any one of them to maybe comment upon their approach and maybe enlighten, and let's keep the discussion focused on when do people uh, plan to do retrograde? Do they plan ad hoc or they prepare for both approaches simultaneously in CLI? And the second question is, how often is retrograde approach used in non-CLI cases? And the third question I would like to propose for discussion briefly is that, do you ever deliver treatment, for example, balloon angioplasty, from through the retrograde approach? And if so, what specialized devices are one needs to have in their lab when planning a retrograde approach? So those are some of the areas. So take it away, whoever, and George Gelati is there, Nick is there, uh, anyone, uh, any comments? Yeah, Subhash, this is uh, this is great. This is Nick Shamas here. Great questions. You know, I, I honestly had the exact same questions in mind, and I was going to toss it to the audience. Is when do you really start doing the uh, retro uh, approach? You know, uh, pedal wise, is it just the CLI? Is it just the claudicant? Uh, and I like to to hear actually your experiences. In my lab, you know, we exclusively limit that to the CLI patients. Uh, we, at this point in time, haven't felt uh, that we need to venture to the claudicant uh, just because we just really don't understand the implication in terms of risk-benefit uh, down the road. But for the CLI, I think it's pretty obvious, uh, you know, this is a salvage procedure and the, and the benefits are overwhelming. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I just want to hear from you guys. Are you doing it for claudicant? You know, I, as I said, we are not, you know, so the question is, are you doing it? And uh, is it... Uh, um, you know, the same techniques, same procedures. Um, are you limiting it to one vessel? You know, you know I mean, we know we, we can focus on angiosomes and all that stuff, but that would not be an issue for the claudicant per se. But are you guys doing it for claudicant? So, uh, good question, sir. So, uh, for in our lab, uh, it is primarily done for CLI. I, I shouldn't say we have never done, but we have in very rare cases. Uh, number one, the only difference that we have, Mehdi's lab has greater experience with retrogrades and uh, and they do it much more frequently than us. The, the only difference I heard from their approach and ours, we generally do not go to an ad hoc switch. So what we would do is that if the antigrade isn't successful in a CLI patient, we would keep them in the house or if it is urgent or if it is not urgent then on a, on a later date and then bring them back for a retrograde. I think this is something we probably need to learn and I'm, I'm sure we're going to invite Mary back because seeing the images of how they prep their patients that they can actually go antigrade and retrograde in the same case would be extremely desirable for each one of us. So Mary, you have any comments on that? Yeah, you know, uh, you know, when I originally started, you know, I used to do the same thing. You know, I used to try integrate. You know, but one of the things is that is the, the level of the culture changed. You know, to be honest with you, and even for me, still sometimes, you know, because we are pretty stubborn people, and I'm talking about myself, and you know, it's hard to give up in an approach when you when you engage it, and sure. especially if you don't have the other uh, uh, approach available, meaning that it's not prepped, and now you have to lift up the drapes, clean it. You know, it's, it's so much. It is so cumbersome, you know, to do it when the patient's already raped, trying to clean the food and all of that and bring the ultrasound and all of that. So so we decided about two and a half years ago, uh, because one is that, you know, we were feeling more comfortable with the tibiopedal access. And the second was that, you know, I was, I didn't, I felt like you know, we were wasting time. You know, we were wasting a lot of money and time trying to integrate that approach for a long period of time, sometimes two hours, honestly, uh, you know, uh, and multiple wires. And uh, and then after using eight wires, we then said, okay, let's use a CTO device. And you, I know you know a lot more about CTOs than I do, CTO devices. And, you know, and then those follow the same track. So now we spend more money, and then those devices didn't work either. So Agreed. because of that, we, we have uh, been, so my nurses now, they're very comfortable. We learn from our surgical colleagues, you know, how to prep the leg. So right off the bat, you know, when we have a CLI patient only, we, you know, prep the leg. Uh, and, uh, and you know, I would say, you know, probably 50% of the time we don't use it, uh, but about 50% of the time we may go, you know, uh, we go down in CLI patients. And we are just like you and others, you know, we, you know, I would say 98% of the time, 97% of the time, we do tibiopedal for CLI patients and for claudication. Uh, we, you know, we have done it, like you said, uh, but rarely. 
Excellent. Yeah. Any other comments? I just have one additional question for Mary. Could you list uh, or at least give some recommendations uh, for uh, any specialized, uh, you did say that, I'm just for the interest of the listeners, some specialized access sheets, guide wires, uh, maybe even delivery balloons and delivery catheters that one should have uh, before yeah. attempting retrograde access. Something yes. bare minimum that need, that is needed. Yes. So, so you know, as I said, you know, I honestly, I've had my own self. I've had, uh, the, I've done a few cases uh, from the uh, pedal, meaning that doing the whole case from the foot, and my experience in general has been bad. And I tell you why. The reason I said experience is bad is that when you do it from the foot, it's very difficult to take images and know where you are. So, sure. uh, you know, when you're coming, you know, when we're coming from the top, obviously you can inject dye. And if you already have a sheet on the top, then what's the point of treating from the bottom? I mean, I guess that's my argument. So sure. if you already have a sheet from the top and you're injecting from the top, why should you treat from the bottom? So I do not like to treat from the bottom. Uh, you know, that's just uh, uh, for those reasons. And the second is that many of these patients don't have, uh, they only have one vessel in the foot. And now I'm putting four or five French sheets to be able to do the things I want to do. So, uh, and you know, the duration of those sheets in those arteries are longer. And then when I remove the sheet, it's very hard to take a nice runoff picture, which Agreed. is what we get criticized for usually by our surgeons. So the patient then goes and is not healing. You don't have a good runoff. You don't know what you achieved. You do hemodynamic assessment. These patients have non-compressible vessels. It's very hard to assess, you know, what their, their perfusion is. So, you know, I really, you know, I genuinely don't like the treating from the foot. So when I get access in a retrograde approach, my goal is to pass the wire and externalize the wire. And I want to minimize putting the devices in the foot. So my workhorse wire is typically to get access is a, I use a Pilot 200 and I use the 018 CXI. Excellent. I typically use a six, 65 centimeter 018 CXI. Uh, because it's shorter, so it's easier to work at the end of the table. And I use the 018 because if the 014 doesn't work, I can then go to a 018 wire. So it gives sure. me the potential to exchange. Then if, if the Pilot 200 does not work for me for various reasons, then I, in order to get the, and I need to put a sheet, I usually either use the Cook, you know, four French sheet, that's short four French sheet, or the Trumo four French sheet. Sure. The O2-1, you know, that, you know, we use it for radials too sometimes. You know, uh, so I use those two sheets if I have to use a sheet in the pedal. Similarly, in the tibial, I use that four French. Now, Turumo uh, is coming up with that uh, slender sheet, you know, that we use now, five French, you know, that is, you know, you know. Now, um, I honestly don't think you need to put a bigger than four French sheet in the foot because, as I said, I treat mainly from the top. So uh, from the standpoint of crossing wires, uh, either if you're coming from the top or you're coming from the bottom, and I know you guys have a lot of experience in this, I, as I said, my workhorse wire is Pilot 200. Sure. If that doesn't work, uh, I then go to CTO wires, and you know I use Approach, Stato, sure. some of those wires. If I need uh, hydrophilic wires outside of uh, Pilot 200, I like Glide Gold a lot. I see. And I use 018 Glide Gold a lot, and I have found it, Honestly, when nothing works, that wire works is magic for me. You know, uh, so Glide Gold 018, they do have it in a long, you know, 300 centimeter. Um, so those are kind of the wires that I use. But from the standpoint of third, I'm sorry, yes. No, go ahead, go ahead, please. Finish your thought. From the, yeah, from the standpoint of, you know, uh, uh, treatment approach, you know, I uh, have been using a lot of chocolate balloons sure. and, uh, you know, for the tibials. I think because in tibials we are limited. You know, I, I don't use a lot of angioscope and part of it is that maybe I don't have experience with it. The reason I don't use angioscope is because by design, angioscope is designed to dissect and open up arteries so you can stent. As you know, it was designed for the coronaries. Sure. So I don't, I have, when I've used it, it hasn't done very well for me, but it could be experience and, and the fact that I haven't used a lot of it. So I don't want to judge it. I'm just telling you my experience. With chocolate, I've really had good experience because by design, it's, 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 you know, the, the struts, you know, the, the stents, the stents, the nitron stent that is on top of the balloon is not touching the vessel. So it's designed not to dissect, but as angioscope, because the wires are on top of the balloon, 
it's designed to at least micro dissect. Now, I think sometimes you get more dissections, you get larger dissections. Aside from that, you know, I, I, what I do is that the other thing that I found very uh, 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 troubling is that, you know, I do these courses like you guys do, and I have vascular surgeons and radiologists and sometimes even cardiologists and experienced people come, and they only use 2O and 2.5 balloons in the TVL vessels. And I honestly think that that's a major undersizing. We typically use 3O. I would say 85 to 90% of the time, we use 3O balloons all the way to the ankles. And I put even 2.5 balloons into the foot. For pedal arch, I have never used bigger than 2O. And that's just because of fear. I don't know. I, but pedal arch, I have never used big. I usually use 1.5 first, and I, if I feel it can take it, I put 2O. For the, you know, the foot, you know, meaning that, you know, DT and DP in the foot, I have I used two five uh, regularly, and then for the tibial vessels and the peroneal, I use three O routinely and three five in the proximal segments chocolate balloon. So what I do is that I typically use a long balloon and maybe a two five two O tapered regular balloon. You know we have Medtronic balloons, we use Medtronic, but I think you can use anybody. Sure. Use one of those, and then we upsize to a chocolate because obviously it's more expensive. You know sure. a three O. Or, or three five, so those are, and I'm I am not afraid of stenting the tibial vessels, you know, proximal sure. vessels, obviously, you know, so TP trunk, and I know you are the guru of that, so so th that's basically a summary of what we do. Fantastic. So uh, this is a great review, and I just want to uh, you know say that uh, the four take home points for everyone who joined in from this excellent discussion, despite the slides. By the way, your slides just reached me. Uh, are four, uh, and Mary, you can correct me. Well, number one is that retrograde approaches are very more aggressive approaches are should be reserved primarily for patients with critical limb ischemia and sh are rarely used in treatment of patients with claudication. Number two is that what Dr. Shishabur suggested is that uh, that uh, that in their lab. Uh, they plan for anti-grade and retrograde approach during the same case, and that requires participation and training not only of the physician, but also of the lab staff and of the fellows together. So this is something we look forward to. Third is that Dr. Shishibur suggested also and stated that in his lab and in most retrograde operators, they use the retrograde approach primarily for imaging, visualization, and for crossing and they would then convert this to an anti-grade approach from the contralateral sheath, from the contralateral side, and do most of the final delivery of devices and final treatment by snaring the retrograde wire. And the final point is that, that the operators uh, trying and planning uh, uh, trying and planning retrograde procedures should have a definite set of complement of devices uh, to, to be able to bail themselves out uh, with the use of strategies and devices that Oshishibo just said, starting with wire escalation and simply a guiding catheter and then moving on to smaller caliber sheets and maybe uh, more advanced techniques of, uh, of uh, dissecting the planes of, uh, of anti-grade and retrograde wires using uh, CART and, uh, and other uh, balloon dilation techniques. So I hope that would be a good summary. Uh, retrograde the lesions and pedal vessels are probably the first place to start instead of going into the compartment or popliteal artery. Uh, and uh, again, he suggested that these vessels are highly prone to trauma and anticoagulation is very important. And ACT target should be at least above 250 or even closer to 300. So I hope, uh, Mary, I've summarized your thoughts, and uh, I would really appreciate if I could invite you back with, with your full complement of videos and cases. This has been a fabulous discussion. I'm sure each one of you enjoyed it very, very thoroughly. The transcript of your slides and the video recording and the audio recording would be placed on XLPAD and also on social media. So please forward it to your colleagues. And of course, uh, other, if there are other thoughts and questions, I would invite you to uh, chime in and, and join in future webcasts. Splendid work, uh, Mary, as always. And with slides or without slides, you are just simply fabulous. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm sure so you did too. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Banerjee. And again, I'm sorry. And uh, I'm happy to also send this. I know that was a PDF file, but when I get back to US, I will send you the slides with the videos and uh, happy to share that with you guys. And thank you so much for having me.